Uh, well, this is Seymour Rocks reporting from Down Under. Um, I just want to report a few things that relate to uh, uh, to New Zealand. Um, now, I get really irritated when, because uh, I follow things quite closely here, um, when I see news that's really important to New Zealand and New Zealanders that I have to get from foreign publications that are are not reported or they're under-reported here. So the first example uh, comes from, well, this morning I just happened to come across a video by Dave Hodges of the Common Sense uh, show uh, in the United States, and he was talking about the um, uh, a reserve bank bill um, that leaves as much unsaid as as it says. Um, so let's just have a uh, a quick look at that. And I did. And I've been through this New Zealand reform banking bill. And uh, they have the Reserve Bank of New Zealand. One aside, I think I find interesting, they still have to pay tribute to the crown. It's right in the right in the wording. <laughs> so much for independence, right? New Zealand, the colony of the city of London. I hope you understand the distinction of what I just said. So I went through this banking legislation kind enough to be sent to me, not by one, but by two New Zealanders. Uh, and I'll tell you, I, I, I'm growing. Uh, my, my respect is really growing for the people of New Zealand. These people are fantastic. Uh, many of them realize they're being subjugated. Some of them, though, send me hate mail, but I think it's trolls from New Zealand. Uh, they see what's happening, and, and they really are tapping in and watching us very closely in the activist level, what we're doing. And um, many of them agree with me that they're beta testing future U.S. policies uh, and they're paralleling what we're doing. And I'm going to talk to you about this banking act and we're going to link it into Senate Bill 3571 set to take effect in January of next year. And you know, it's right around the corner. September, October, November, December. I mean, can you believe we're almost two-thirds of the way through 2020? And what a miserable year for our country this has been. I don't know how to describe the New Zealand bill. Is it a beta test? Some, because I think they're going to realize this a lot faster than we are. Um, is it paralleling what we're doing? Absolutely, positively. So I read through this massive document. I spent two hours on this. And that's a long time for me to spend on a document. All the years I did uh, work with research and stat and psychology uh, and, and getting through graduate programs, you get really good at cutting to the chase and cutting corners and pulling out the main meaning just to save time. Well, this still took me two hours. And the reason it took me two hours, it's not so much what this bill in New Zealand says, and it's in the first reading. It's also what this bill does not say. And this is why I had to do a more comprehensive review. And this was really um, mind-boggling what they have. They're paralleling a lot of the autonomy of the Federal Reserve Bank here in the United States. Um, classic central bank organization pays tribute to the crown. But there's something in there, Section 47 in Section 2, um, control over all monies. Now, this is where it gets really interesting. They mention coin and paper. And what I don't know yet is New Zealand experiencing a coin shortage like America is and change is not being given. I don't know that. I suspect that's probably starting or has been going on. But here's what the bill very cleverly leaves open. It opens the door for any kind of currency to come in, any medium of exchange. There is no closed regulatory process with a well-defined currency, such as the Federal Reserve note. 
Okay, if they had a New Zealand reserve note, that would limit by statute what they could do. But they leave it totally open. I kept reading and reading and reading and say, okay, come to a conclusion. Tell me what all this encompasses. And they don't. It's open-ended, which means, hello, it's blank check territory for the New Zealand parliament and that crazy dictatorial communist prime minister. But Section 47, control over all monies. Digital currency, baby. That's what's coming. And they also talk a lot about, they spend a lot of language talking about reevaluation and possible de-evaluation. Now, I'm paraphrasing those terms, but that they centered a lot in the authority they have out of their board of governors to perform those actions. Uh, let me jump to what I've already said about America and the Fed coin. When the exchange happens with the Fed coin, and trust me, it's coming. It's not a matter of if, it's when. And one theory has a box arriving at your house or apartment, and inside are these plastic things with the COVID CDC symbols and such and such. And they have a letter that says the use of coin can spread COVID, blah, blah, blah. And that's not totally an untrue statement. Okay, so they're basing this exchange on a matter of fact. Viruses can stay on those surfaces for a short while and be transmitted. So they want you to wear gloves and they want you to put everything in these bags and then mail them back and whatever cash you've had in your house, you'll get uh, uh, compensated for it with the new Fed coin. Now, the other thing is saying that you've got to go to your bank and do the exchange. Man, that, can you imagine how cumbersome this is going to be? And even in the first method, they're going to have to employ uh, literally probably hundreds of thousands of people to handle this because most of you have rainy day funds in your house. You realize power outage could take down the ATMs and, you, hey, you still got to be able to get what you need to get, right? So this is a daunting task. Now, I've said this before, so I'll make it real brief. In an American bank account, they have complete control over you. Their, it's their money once you put it in there. That's federal court ruling 2012. You are an unsecured creditor. And you're at the bottom of the pecking order for recompensation in the event of loss. And by the way, the New Zealanders made that real clear too. They didn't list a pecking order, but they said they determined the pecking order. Those are my words, not theirs, but effectively that's what their legislation is saying. Now, uh, let's get down to it. The dollar would be worth something here, okay? Some imaginary number, okay? And we're going vertically downward, meaning less value. The Fed coin, I promise you, and I've been told this by an insider, the Fed coin will come in significantly less than the dollar. Some people are saying as much as 80%. Other people are talk, I'm talking to say, Dave, it's more like probably 20 to 40% range. But anyway, even if it's on the low end, whatever your standard of living is right now based on the money that you have in savings, money that you have in your possession, you just took a 20% hit. And it could be as much as 80 if we split the baby, it's 50. And this is a real sneaky way of doing currency devaluation. You see, when they did this in Cyprus, remember when they just said 50% off the top? You had 10,000, now you have 5,000. Oh, the people were pissed. There was riots in the streets. Well, they're trying to avoid a national uprising. So they're going to disguise the fact that you're actually getting less money. So that's the American model for the Fed coin exchange to the dollar. That part, whether we have to send it in or whether we have to walk in our money to do the exchange and they'll do it automatically with your bank accounts in both instances, you, we can argue that ad infinitum until that day comes. But I will tell you this, you're going to get a lot less value and your standard of living is going to drop precipitously based on this exchange. And where will the money go? The gap between the two currencies? Well, you already know the answer to that question. Globalists are famous for causing the fall of societies and profiting on the, on the demise. And they're going to profit on this demise. <clears throat> well, what I read in this New Zealand legislation that I took precipitous notes on in my chicken scratch shorthand that every graduate student advanced degree person has to resort to uh, to survive. So as I look here and I can read my hieroglyphics, they hear fees and levies on the counts. OK, and in that section, this is part of where they leave the monies open for reevaluation. In other words, we say what the money's worth. We determine, hello, 
New Zealand's going to do the same thing that we're doing. Now, the one of the people that wrote to me out of the th um, three people that sent me this information, and they weren't together. They were separate, and the, in, the mailings were a couple days apart. Even though this legislation's on the first reading, they said they're fast-tracking all their legislation using COVID emergency clauses, and they think this could go into effect very, very quickly. Very quickly. And they said there's no escape for New Zealanders being on digital currency because it's predetermined the U.S. is going on and the U.S. is the reserve currency, blah, blah, blah. You get the idea, right? Follow the leader. Okay, so I think that's really sound observation by this New Zealander. Uh, and it sounds like they know quite a bit about finance. Um, let's, go, let's go in here a little deeper here. The fees and levies and accounts. Okay, so we've established the fact of differential money worth and who's going to profit, and the fact that they've left it open to do digital, even though in New Zealand they don't specifically list the word digital, they leave it wide open that they could do this if this were law tomorrow. They could just say, okay, all right, turn all your money in. This is what we're doing. Um, <laughs> there's nothing to prevent them in this legislation from doing that. Now, the other thing I think you need to be aware of, I think this parallels the discussion of what's happened in America when I talk to people like Bob Kudla from Trade Genius, and Bob talks about um, um, zero interest rates. I, I think this is kind of the New Zealand equivalent here. They talked about fees and levies in a very general, non-specific manner. Very general. I mean, I was shocked that I'm thinking, okay, tell me something. All right, I get it. I get it. Uh, you're giving me directions and you're saying, go to the city of Denver, but how about some cross streets? Well, that's how general this was with fees and levies. It was like, okay, we'll get you to the city and we'll kind of leave it to you to guess what they're going to do. That's another blank check for doing what they want to do. But they did leave themselves the right to levy taxes and fees on banking transactions. Now, we've heard about this for a while, haven't we, in America, right? They're going to charge you to see a teller. They're going to charge you interest on the money you have in the bank. Oh, my. And if you're digital currency, whether it's Mark of the Beast, okay, or it's in your cell phone, or however they're going to distribute this, everything is technically in their account. So you will constantly be paying tribute to the owners of the Reserve Bank of New Zealand. This is predictive for America. This is where they own you and own your money. Oh, and if you're a bad boy or girl, we'll suspend your account. You go up there and you swipe your phone to get your gas, and it doesn't work. Wait a minute, why? Well, that's right. You wrote that nasty email of protest the other day, and the social credit system has just knocked you on your backside. Oh, you think I'm stretching the truth? <laughs> uh, I work in this. 18 to 20 hours a day. And I can tell you, I see all the roads coming together. It's social credit, it's digital currency, it's fees and levies. It's all coming into one location for one purpose, total control over you and your money. This is neo-feudalism. Your money is worth what they say it is. Now, how long will it be till they put wage and price controls into this? All right, now let's jump over to the American side. 116th Congress, Senate Bill 3571, take effect 2021. They leave the door open for digital currency. The legislation is so broad-based, it's the same model as what we're seeing here in New Zealand. It's not what they're telling you is as important as what they are not telling you, but leaving a blank check for them to do exactly what they want. They will control the money system to the benefit of the elite, which means the destruction of the middle and upper middle class. And I ask you a question. Is there not precedent for this behavior already in the United States? When the lockdowns came, who was locked down? Were the big corporates? No, no. The box stores made record profits. Their competitors in the small business sector. You're done. You're done and you're done. And 
all, Dem all, all large metropolitan areas today are in the control of the Democrats. And the Democrats were on board with this for the reasons we've stated ultimate times before that I don't want to go back into. But this was the plan. Destruction of the middle and upper middle class. And ultimately, this is going to be who takes the biggest hit. What is it? 60 percent of small businesses now are out of business. What is a 30? Michael Snyder quoted this the other day. 32 percent of uh, people that were rehired are now unhired. Another 26 percent are kind of hanging on by their fingernails. That's what the data tells us. Mike wrote a great article that on his website. Ladies and gentlemen, this is no accident. As I said, all roads lead to Rome. Today, lead to economic, social, cultural, and psychological subjugation. Seriously. Seriously. This is what we're headed into. New Zealand is showing us the way. And they're telling us right now exactly what 2021 will be when the Senate bill becomes law. The Republic. The second example um, relates to the wearing of of masks. So we've had um, regulations brought in uh, that now uh, the wearing of masks is mandatory on uh, public transport. Uh, now, what I didn't realise until I read Zero Hedge a financial publication out of out of the United States that um, there's going to be, they said, a seven hundred dollar fine for people who uh, who who do not uh, comply. Uh, now I've seen nothing of this in the media, and because uh, I don't follow the uh, the only one. Um, reporting of this with that sort of headline was the New Zealand Herald. Well, I don't really follow the New Zealand Herald because uh, I don't really want to pay pay for it. Uh, and then the only other publication is Radio New Zealand that had this generalised article about kind of what it all meant. And then they just had uh, two lines uh, attached at the very bottom uh, that said that there would be uh, a $300 fine or anything up to $1,000. Uh, so I had to learn that uh, from the foreign media. Well, the other issue that's uh, come to the fore, the headlines in New Zealand, uh, was that the Speaker of the House, the Speaker of the Parliament, Trevor Mallard, has told the leader of the New Zealand People's Party uh, and Advance New Zealand uh, that they have to take down a video that they made about for forced vaccination uh, in New Zealand because it's... Uh, fake news and they shouldn't have edited uh, uh, something from Parliament, uh, which actually shows that the Minister, Megan Woods, admitting that there was provision under this Act for, uh, for, um, for forced vaccination, which turns out to be for uh, people coming into the country, whether foreigners or returning uh, New Zealanders. So as part of the the sort of propaganda. Uh, they said that the director of health, Ashley Bloomfield, had been placed on record as saying there would be no forced vaccination. So I would just like to have a quick look um, at the words of um, of both Jacinda Ardern and Ashley Bloomfield. Uh, this is I don't know when. Ashley Bloomfield was saying this, but Jacinda Ardern's comments came in March when actually the danger of, of, uh, the, the, that, they, uh, that the virus, the pandemic, looked a whole lot more dangerous than it has in fact turned out to be. 
Uh, so they are both saying you don't need masks. And now, of course, they're, uh, they're mandatory under threat of a, of a, of a large fine. Um, so, yeah, just make up your own mind. face masks if you like, but it is not really any protection. You can use a face mask if you like, but it is not really any protection. The touching the face message I'm hearing coming through a yeah. lot. That's actually easier said than done. So uh, in those scenarios, I mean, I, I hear, I see people wearing masks. Your views on masks, because a lot of people are going out, buying up their hand sanitizer, buying masks and also toilet paper, but is there any reason why masks are something that people should be using? So for the general public, if you don't have symptoms, there's no need to wear a mask. The thing is the virus can still get in through your eyes. So if somebody's going to sneeze on you, the mask will only protect your nose. It won't protect your eyes. The people who will need to be wearing masks right now is if you are symptomatic, if yep. you have symptoms, if you're, if you're sneezy, wear a mask because we know that the particles that you sneeze out could possibly infect people. So what that does is keeps those particles inside your mask. You can't reinfect yourself. And so masks are really good for that. Masks can be good because they make you aware of your face. Mm. And so they stop you touching your face. But the best thing to do is just train yourself to put your hands down and not actually touch your face. You don't need to be wearing a mask all the time unless you are symptomatic, you have symptoms. And so there's, um, there's a lot of people buying them thinking they're being protected. But actually, it's about having good hygiene and keeping your distance from 